Welcome to the digital series. I'm Mark Orsi, president of Global Resilience Federation, a nonprofit that builds and connects threat information sharing communities. GRF manages and supports many sectors and acts as an information hub, enriching and sharing actionable intelligence generated by members and public and private sources in order to advance resilience. As you may know, GRF has recently established a new community, the Business Resilience Council, to provide members with best practices and information supporting their operational continuity and disaster response. The BRC covers physical security issues like major weather events, pandemics, as well as geopolitical threats, civil unrest, and terrorism. Reach out if you'd like to learn more at info at grf.org. Membership is complimentary until June and half off for the first year. Next slide. Thank you for joining us today for the briefing, CodeCov Attack, Impact, Mitigation, and Preventing Supply Chain Exploitation. This session will discuss the CodeCov compromise, supply chain risks, and how you can prevent and mitigate attacks like this. With us for this discussion are Jordan LaRose, Lead Incident Responder with F-Secure, and John Boyens, Deputy Chief of the Computer Security Division at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Jordan leads the Incident Response Service for F-Secure's North American presence. In this role, he delivers incident response and penetration testing services, which allow him to stay abreast of the most recent developments in security and give clients perspectives from both sides of the threat landscape. He also trains consultants in digital forensics. John's responsibilities include cybersecurity research and development at NIST and cybersecurity standards and guidelines for federal agency security programs. He also leads NIST's Cyber Supply Chain Risk Management Program and helps develop and coordinate the Department of Commerce's cybersecurity policy. And he represents the department in the administration's interagency cybersecurity policy process. He led a team that developed and issued a set of foundational, standardized, and feasible practices to help organizations manage cyber supply chain risks to their organizations and systems. It was released in 2015 as NIST Special Publication 800-161, Supply Chain Risk Management Practices for Federal Information Systems and Organizations. There'll be time for Q&A at the end. Please use the GoToWebinar question box. Jordan, let's open it with you. We all heard about the solar winds late last year, uh, and our concern grew quickly as we realized that that attack had compromised tens of thousands of customers running SolarWinds Orion platform. Now in April, another of these supply chain attacks was uncovered. In this case, it was the developer tools. Can you please provide us an overview of the CodeCov attack and what it means to their tens of thousands of clients? Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, in cybersecurity lately, supply chain, as you've said, has become more and more of a uh, a common attack vector. CodeCov in particular, um, they were compromised, you know, a few months ago. The attacker made their way into the, the system and then essentially took over the production environment. So was able to push, you know, code and it updates to uh, to CodeCov's code base. Um, and what that means is essentially any client of CodeCov's that uses their code base was then affected and infected by this attack. So once, uh, once you know, those files were downloaded from CodeCov, uh, all of these clients were then breached and then now they're you know, clients are at risk. And I realize there's a lot of <laughs> clients in there, but um, essentially, yeah, it's it's uh, just like with a lot of supply chain attacks, it's it's a waterfall effect, right? Like, um, you know, one client gets breached and it just, you know, snowballs from there on. So, you know, we're still, I think even just today, uh, more news came out on, you know, what, what impacts this is having and who the downstream victims are, um, but, you know, it's uh, it's one in a uh, in a sea of many supply chain attacks that we're seeing. Um, and I suppose one thing I can also say is not every supply chain attack is uh, is making the news. So. Yeah. Um, so, John, uh, you know, based on that, and I guess, you know, let's go back in time. Uh, what was the impetus for the 2015 special publication 800-161 on supply chain risk management practices? And have you seen the risks evolve since that time? Sure, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> the impetus really happened back in around uh, the 2000s, where NIST 
there was a recognition in the George W. Bush administration for those out there that are old enough to re remember that, but uh, that the the government uh, was using an increasing amount of commercial off the shelf uh, products and services where uh, 25, 30 years ago, it was mainly, you know, I would say 80, 85% customized, internal customized products. Uh, you know, it's it's become uh, probably 85, 95% uh, commercial off the shelf products. And even when we do develop uh, customized products, we're, we're using cost products and components internally. So it was just a, a recognition of uh, of risk and uh, lot, a lot has changed since then. Uh, but I will say that uh, supply chain has always been one of those things that I remember I was at the RSA conference back in like 2011 and they were calling it uh, the new black, right? And it was sexy and you know, what happened two years later, it was it was forgotten about. And part of the reason why it was forgotten about is because it's a hard problem. And a lot of organizations, and even inside the government, some of the most sophisticated uh, offensive organizations look at supply chain and say, okay, if I have $10, right, what am I gonna spend it on? Am I gonna spend it on you know, some uh, baseline security, which I need to do, or am I gonna spend it on a very hard problem? And so that has always been a debate. And I think what's happened over the last few years, uh, you know, you just hate reading about these type of uh, attacks like CodeCov and SolarWinds and everything else. And it's, it's horrible. But the good part is, is it actually keeps the awareness out there. And as Jordan pointed out, those are only the ones that are getting the press. So uh, supply chain attacks are not nothing new and even software supply chain attacks are not new you know over the last few years we've seen king slayer uh c cleaner not patia uh they exist out there and you know we can get into the the why and the heart of of why software supply chain is difficult but no it's not new um it's horrible to hear these but it's actually good that uh, it's bringing attention to a very hard problem. Thanks, John. Yeah. Uh, so, Jordan, just kind of building on that, you know, in this specific attack, CodeCov, uh, you know, we've seen announcements around, or I've seen in the press around uh, HashiCorp, Rapid7, Monday, Twilio, Confluent Coalition. Uh, some of these are cloud service providers. Some of them are, um, you know, have, have their private source code repositories um, uh, visible to these attackers. Uh, you know, what could that mean downstream? What could that cascading effect be if some of these tools and you know, uh, other uh, supply chain uh, code bases have been compromised? Yeah, so I, I think, um, and th this is something that you know, I think it'd be great for us to dive into at length further down the line. But, you know, if these technologies are used in environments where they're given, you know, a, a high level of privilege, essentially, like, um, you know, uh, if we just look at, say, Rapid7's product, it's it's an MDR agent, right? Um, so, you know, MDR agents, sometimes they have kernel level privileges, sometimes they have, you know, domain administrator, um, but generally they've, they've got a high level of privilege on the network. So what that means is if Rapid7's, you know, code base was compromised, if the EDR source code was compromised and an update is pushed, then suddenly there's a, a backdoor in all of their clients' networks um, and a highly privileged one at that, right? Um, that's that's kind of the the uh, I guess second blade to this type of attack is that you know not only is it is it far reaching and it affects a lot of people but it affects these products and these softwares that have you know such a high level of privilege and you know I guess posture inside of so many networks um, and you know this again this is not something we're just seeing in CodeCov this is something that you know, with solar winds, it's it's <laughs> pretty much right there. With solar winds, you have the same thing, and then 
Um, you know, Solar Winds was in so many other environments where you know those people controlled software or hardware products that could then be backdoored. You know, it's it's very easy to see that snowball building and rolling downhill um, as you look at you know what's affected by this this type of attack. Um, you know, the the only thing that's really limiting it is the amount of effort the uh, the attackers willing to put in. Quite honestly. Yeah, I think um, you know, John, you've probably seen uh, the long ball on this, right? You've seen this develop over time. Like you said, from you know, COTS tools to now, it looks like they're they're uh, really grabbing code bases that are, you know, will be widely used. Um, you have what kind of evolution have you seen that these advanced threat actors are using, um, you know, over this this period of time? Uh, the the threat actors, so in a lot of the cases, the actual, um, this isn't always the case, but we have seen where the actual entrance point into um, the initial target is not all that advanced. What's, what really often becomes advanced is when uh, they get a little bit further down that waterfall and their ability to uh, hide and move laterally throughout systems. And the sophistication behind that, uh, to be able to do that without being discovered, um, is, is the sophistication, I think, is, is pretty incredible. And that's one of the things that make it challenging. Um, I think that's also one of the things that's, that's changing a lot of the mindsets in this field over the last few years where there's more of a recognition that um, organizations can't be 100% secure, that there's there's no such thing as 100% security. And, uh, you know, I, I like the, <laughs> the name of your organization is quite apt because I think there's a lot, a big movement uh, toward resilience, right? How can an organization um, keep operating and keep fulfilling its mission even after an attack? All right, so it's 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 that resilience piece of it that I think a lot of folks are leaning on, and the way I look at this is kind of three three ways. You know, I, I look at it from the the developer perspective, I look at it from the acquirer and the using perspective, but also it's not just that that one and two developing and buying. It's also how those organizations uh, develop their um, and architecture um, their information systems, right? Uh, there's been a lot of talk, talk about zero trust architecture, right? So it, a lot of these things I think are going into that converse, conversation, which is already complex it is, is, as is, but I think the solutions need to be equally um, complex, even if we simplify them up front. Yeah, and I like that too, and I think uh, we'll play on that as far as the different, you know, the different parties within an organization that might have some impact on reducing risk from this type of attack, um, and also, you know, help in, in mitigating it. Um, so, Jordan, just, just you know, as a follow-up to earlier question, it took a, it took a year right, to detect the SolarWinds attack. It took four months for the code cov, and there may be some downstream impacts because they've now they've had access to code bases of other, other tools. Uh, what do you think organizations should, um, you know, that are developing code or that are uh, developing services for customers uh, that are broadly used, what do you think they should be doing to get better at identifying when they've been targeted or, or you know, identifying this kind of um, attack? Yeah, so uh, much like John said, you know, the initial attack vector is is usually not that sophisticated. Um, you know, these guys will come in with your classic, you know, phishing into malware dropper, or you know, they'll uh, they'll use some kind of newly released exploit. You know, right? How the there's like bad potato that's out there. You know, any of those kind of named pipe escalations. Um, so like when it comes to, uh, to detecting these things, um, I think it's, it's about the same as, as most other types of attacks. However, when it comes to, you know, building a, an SDLC and a pipeline that 
you know, can, I guess, detect changes to the code base. So essentially like the, the exploitation phase of the supply chain attack. Um, that's something that's a bit more complex, right? Like having things in place like, uh, you know, any kind of redundancy checks where, you know, most, most developers will do a peer review um, in the SDLC process, but, you know, having anything that essentially does like a diff, right? When you, you push new code so that you can see exactly what was changed. Um, and, you know, you have a robust process where multiple people are looking at these things that are pushed up. Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that you really want to have in place to make sure that, you know, whether or not you detect that initial attack on your network, you're making sure that there are no um, unauthorized edits to your code base, uh, especially when it comes to products that have such a uh, an impact on client security if they are to be compromised. Yeah, I, I like the um, you know two pairs of eyes on every change, right? At least at least two pairs of eyes to make sure. At least, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so you talked a little bit about secure, maybe a secure SDLC um, process. I, what's interesting about this attack for CodeCov is, right, that's developer tools which actually are used in um, in identifying what code has been tested, right? So potentially manipulating that code could say, you know, code could fit through somebody else's pipeline as if it has been tested when it hasn't. Um, I, I, that sounds like a another <laughs> advanced stage of attack. Um, so John, you know, why do you, why do you think these attacks, these types of attacks, are so dangerous? Like, what makes what makes a supply chain more vulnerable than other supply chains? What um, what increases the risk for enterprises or for you know organizations in their supply chain? So, Mark, you actually you 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 made some you made a remark just now about that I think kind of illustrates that, and that's it's you know if your tools are corrupt, then it can let stuff go. But I think that can be said about internal developmental processes too. So I think what makes it so unique is that uh, it's there's been a lack of recognition of the risk. Right, so uh, third-party risk period, you know, just supply chain risk, I think has been uh, ignored for quite some time. But in the software space, in the development um, stage, if you look at, you know, a software development life cycle, where you go from the development to the delivery to the use and maintenance uh, disposal, I think what has been ignored quite a bit is that that actual development phase right and it's even if an attacker gets in there and you're trying to validate different things automatically if you've been had they have your validation too right so you you get yeah, into they, they could write of, the test code right they could write the yeah, test code. right so if you're releasing an s-bomb that s-bomb can be corrupt too right i mean a thief doesn't enter a store, you ask them for a list, they're not going to give you everything they stole. They're going to give you what they want to give you. So it's, it, I think it's just the complexity uh, with how software is developed now too, because there's, there's, not, there's not a single language and there's not a single development process. And many organizations, uh, particularly those organizations that develop software for their own use, have a different model, right? It's not a packaged software model where you wrap something up in a disk and, and ship it to somebody. And so you you add that development complexity onto, I think what Jordan mentioned earlier, which is a lot of this software has, the just by the very um, nature of the software, asks and demands for privileged access to fully utilize the capabilities of the software. And then a lot of this software uh, has privileged access to other systems that quite often are the crown jewels, right? So that makes it uh, a little bit more challenging and difficult. And then I'd add, you know, that nowadays it isn't just a supplier handing off a product to an acquirer. With software, you need those 
automatic updates, right? Those patches, you need constant contact. So every time there's a contact back to that supplier, the developer, that's an, that's an access point, right? So it's that, uh, it, I mean, the bottom line, I think it's just the complexity of how information uh, systems and software are delivered and used and developed now. Yeah, I think so. So before we get to the the sort of what you know, how can we detect and mitigate if we have been attacked? I think if we go to those three um, those three players uh, in this in this uh, game, to like the developer or the acquirer of of software tools or the users, uh, maybe we can break that down and talk through what each that can then can do. Um, maybe on the detection side, and then maybe on the you know, detection prevention, and then maybe on recovery side. So, from a developer, right? I think, and, and maybe it's an enterprise as a whole. It sounds like they should be developing these secure software development life cycles, which have, you know, manual checks. It right? It's not completely automated um, to get stuff out the door. Uh, John, what do you? Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I mean, there are system development lifecycle. There's, you know, we we release a um, secure software development framework, but there's lots of different system development frameworks out there. But all of these, uh, and there, it's it's not like there's a lack of information on on good coding practices, right? Safe Code has done a lot. Uh, Business Software Alliance has released their own framework. Uh, and a lot of these frameworks have those processes in to be able to uh, check and validate and everything internally from a development side. So the, the information is out there. Uh, we just need uh, more recognition and practice, I believe. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jordan, same sort of same question. Like, what what's your thoughts on? whether it's the frameworks or, you know, what should developers be doing to ensure they have that secure software delivery? So I think a metaphor that comes up a lot in the security industry is, is cybersecurity as a chain, right? Like, uh, you know, you think of it literally as like a chain with all those links that are, that are put together. Um, and, you know, cyber, any organization, any development lifecycle, et cetera, any of those are only going to have cybersecurity that's as strong as the weakest link in that chain. Um, now, the part of the metaphor that I think people don't think about as much is uh, you might have a, a very long chain, per se, of all of these different softwares that are linked together and share privileges, share computers, hosts, et cetera. Um, but if you're able to divide that up, you know, essentially in terms of segmentation of network, segmentation of privilege, segmentation of, you know, review, et cetera. Um, that's really where you're going to find a lot of success, I think. It's very difficult in today's uh, environment, especially when we're talking about things like cloud technology, right? It's, it's so easy to be like, uh, you know, say I'm a, a developer and I'm trying to you know, build this new product. Oh, well, let me just import this library that will help me create random numbers to generate for my software. Or let me install this, uh, you know, Docker container on my development box so that I can, you know, run these tests or whatever. Um, and I think what we really need to do as a community is be more conscientious about all of those little steps that we're taking along the way all of those different softwares that we're, we're tying together to create this final product. You know, what cloud can do is amazing, but it's also a, a, a very long chain of risks, to extend that metaphor, uh, where we're, we're really, uh, we're putting a lot on the line and we're putting all these technologies together. And if just one of them falls down as part of one of these, you know, supply chain attacks, uh, then suddenly you've got a huge problem on your hands, right? Like, again, going back to, to CodeCov, um, you know, HashiCorp Vault was compromised. I know from penetration testing, from incident response work that I've done, um, HashiCorp Vault is used in tons and tons of cloud environments. Um, thankfully, there's no evidence that, uh, you know, anything beyond their GPG key was compromised, but 
if that attacker had gone and pushed a malicious update to HashiCorp Vault, you know, Vault is trusted with so many secrets and so many uh, so many privileges in all these environments that you know if it's tied to all of these other aspects by that chain, it becomes a very large risk very very quickly. Um, so you know that that's really my key piece of advice, both for developers and software acquirers and even users, um, is to really think about how many different things that that you're sort of tying together whenever you're you know you're doing your even if it's just your your daily job and thinking of that from both like a privileged standpoint but also like a a network and and host based standpoint yeah i think so, sort of oh, go ahead so john can i add one one more thing to is I've, i i know a company that does a lot of uh they broke down their development processes and in each one of them they do some red teaming and pen testing um, from the perspective of both insider threat and a state act, state actor, nation state actor, right? So trying to get to the, the most sophisticated, what would happen if? And they've had a lot of success in, in creating their own kind of secret sauce, uh, you know, vulnerability and protection program during development. Yeah, I think, it, you know, when you're, when a nation state uh, actor is in your network, they essentially look like an insider threat, right? At that point, um, once they've gotten in. Uh, we, as as an IT professional, what kind of monitoring should you be doing of, of you know, whether it's your internal systems and applications or your external, uh, you know, cloud SaaS solutions? What are the things that you should be monitoring um, to help, uh, help give you early warning of, of that there's a problem? Uh, Jordan. Yeah, so I mean that's a. Uh, that's it's a, the, it's a big, that's a big question, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a. Uh, I, I don't we think it's a question. We could be here for a couple hours, but yeah. Let's... <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's a question that has a single answer, right? But right. Um, I think the the best way to think about uh, a problem like that that is so broad um, is to think about it in terms of maturity, right? Like, uh, you know, you you can't. Uh, when it comes to security, you, you just can't go from zero to 100, right? If you're starting out with a completely unsecured flat network, uh, you can't just turn around and buy uh, EDR and just expect everything to be okay. You know, it's it's building up, it's it's using, you know, all of those those tools that are given you, you know, you start with things that are built in, like let's say it's an AD environment, you know, you're putting in things like, Laps or you know managed service accounts, you know leveraging those things. Once you've kind of done your due diligence there, then you move up to you know maybe AV, maybe firewalls. You know it, it's all about building up and building up. But you know if if I'm in this ideal world where everybody's already done that due diligence, um, the biggest thing I I always point to is EDR. You know you you want that total visibility. You want human eyes on it. You want people. Um, who are just sitting there with a magnifying glass, essentially, and saying, that doesn't look quite right. You know, uh, I think it's interesting that you were talking about how an APT can look like an insider threat. Um, that's definitely true. You know, I've, I've responded to a lot of APT level incidents where we thought it was an insider threat. <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was sometimes a matter of weeks before we figured out it, it was not. But I think what's also really tough about those types of situations is it's not just you think it's an insider threat. If it's an insider threat, you probably don't even know it's a threat <laughs> for the first first couple of weeks, sometimes months, right? Um, so that's why that human element is so important to me. You know, having somebody sitting there and and seeing you know things go by uh, and essentially saying like, well, hey, how come you know 29 days out of the year there was never a, uh, you know, I don't know, a, a 48886 uh, event log triggered. And then suddenly on this day, there was, you know, they'll look into it and probably 99 times out of 100, it's false, false positive, it's it's no issue. But it's that, that one time that it's not, that's the whole reason you have that EDR, right? That's the whole reason you have those human eyes. So, you know, even if you're not in a, a maturity place where you can, uh, you know, sensibly step into the EDR environment, just having people looking at these things and kind of 
looking for those anomalies, I think is always going to be your your best and first defense. Yeah, it's it's uh, sort of instrumenting everything and looking for anomalous activity. That's uh, that's I think that's where the human human comes in a lot right now. Um, I somebody uh, wrote Brendan mentioned also never run code that wants you to curl a remote script and pipe it through Bash. I think that's very specific to the code cov uh, attack. <laughs> um, I don't know, Jordan, any comment on that one? Uh, yeah, no, def definitely specific to the uh, the code cov attack. I, I think their uh, their script was specifically called Bash Uploader, if I remember correctly. So, um, yeah, no, no, very uh, very apropos advice, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no. but always relevant. It's, yeah, it's I, all you know. It goes back to that chain, right? You're just you're thinking about all those pieces. You're slapping together to make that work. And John, John, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit because I'm thinking of you as as sort of the more of the process and policy person. But when you get to the procurement team, you know, are there checks and contractual obligations that you need to build in to ensure that there's secure practices followed, um, and that there's you know appropriate monitoring going on? Uh, from from your vendors, from your supply chain. Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and you know I'll, I'll be the first to admit that uh, from a government perspective, we have not always been the best at procurement and acquisition. Um, <clears throat> the federal acquisition system is, I think, always been kind of well known as a little bit broken because it's highly based off of making government funds available to a broad swath of folks and quite often using um, different socio socioeconomic uh, you know laws to direct funds in certain directions I mean that's that's the way it was built that's a priority it was always based off of cost schedule performance um, and security was kind of an afterthought and uh that's been my bane since i've worked in this space and i think it's finally uh become more recognized that it's an issue so that thus the secure technology act of 2018 uh and the establishment of the federal acquisition security council right so i mean these are all good steps i would point to the executive order last that was released last week on uh you know the cyber eo uh a section four is very focused on software supply chain uh and that is looking at it from a procurement space so uh it's more setting up requirements uh that developers are going to have to follow if they want to sell to the federal government right so it, there, there's, it's, it's an somewhat of an oddly uh, compared to past executive orders. It's, it's roughly 40 pages, which is a monster for an executive order, and I think it has like over 70 individual tasks with very tight deadlines. Um, but, but we are trying to make headway on the the procurement side of this, and and start looking at, um, NIST has a big, big lead in the, um, that section four that I called out on the software supply chain. I'll just say that we released, we recently released a call for position papers. We're having a workshop uh, on June 2nd and 3rd, I believe. And, <clears throat> and we're going to be engaging with uh, the smart industry folks on trying to create uh, different mechanisms to solve that procurement side, but not just the procurement side, right? This is everything about supply chain is relationships, and it's it's trust in those relationships. So um, it's working with the software developers, and it's working with the uh, federal government procurement side as well. So um, we're we're, we, we've started the road down the road, I guess. We, we haven't even reached halfway, but we're, we've at least started walking down the right road, I think. Yeah, thanks, John. I think just to, just to um, play on that a bit too, uh, so there's a question that came in, and, and just for those on the call, uh, you can uh, ask a question anytime uh, using the Q&A feature. Um, 
So the question was, you know, who is responsible for letting the attack happen? Is it CodeCov? Is it the users of CodeCov? How do you prevent such an attack from an end user perspective? And uh, I'll, I'll leave the last one uh, after that. But Jordan, what, what are your thoughts on that, on, on responsibilities here? So, I mean, I'll uh, I'll talk in general and sort of just about CodeCov because I think, um, you know, th this is a question that's that's going to be asked with every supply chain attack, right? Like it's, uh, <laughs> and honestly, it's it's a question that's asked in any incident. Um, I'm I'm asked it, I think, on a daily basis, quite honestly. Um, and uh, you know, it it goes back. I I hate to uh, just you know keep beating a dead horse with this metaphor here, but uh, with this this chain concept, right? Like, um, I wouldn't point the finger at any one person. You know, uh, what I would do is say that you know we we've as evolved into a space where we're relying on so many dependencies, we're relying on, you know, trusting so many different organizations and developers and, you know, software and appliances and, you know, the list goes on and on and on, right? Um, so from my perspective, it's it's really like, we've we've got a long way to go, you know, like, like John was saying towards the beginning of, of the discussion, um, this is something that, has largely been ignored for for years and years and years. You know, it's it's uh, it's essentially to to use SDLC terminology, it's been risk accepted for you know the past twenty plus years, quite honestly. Um, and uh, now we're in this position where, just like building up to that EDR agent, we need to build up this resiliency and this ability to to stop these types of attacks. So. When it comes to who's at fault, you know, it's it's every single piece of this chain that that ended up with this, you know, severe of an attack. So, you know, what I would say is is in the future, um, it's going to be things like what I've been talking about, what John's been talking about, and and so many other just little, you know, security levers and switches that we're going to have to pull in order to, you know, stop stuff like this in the future. Uh, yeah, so kind of extending. So, so we we talked a little bit about you know off the shelf software. Now we have these sort of tools and technologies that are um, where you know code may be impacted, and you're 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 using them in your systems. Um, what about you know SaaS solutions? Um, you know, how do we sort of hold to the fire uh, providers of of SaaS solutions to monitor for misuse, or you know, is it is it our responsibility as a, as a, uh, a user of that system, or should it be the responsibility of the, the SaaS provider? And uh, maybe it's unique to the different type of solution. Uh, Jordan, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's going to be on both sides of the coin, right? Like, uh, <laughs> I think uh, I think what everybody would love, you know, whether you're a developer or a CISO or you know security engineer, is to say. That's not my responsibility <laughs> for for anything, really, right? Like you, you uh, you don't want to be the person that uh, that gets uh, gets crucified when everything goes wrong, right? But uh, I think in reality, uh, it's really it's an effort on both sides, right? Like the the software provider should be doing everything they can to you know secure and monitor the, their SDLC. They should have a, a secure pipeline for pushing things like updates. You know, SAS is is full of just you know constant tweaks and changes, which can be great from a you know bug fixing perspective or from a you know a service and usability perspective. Um, but that also really opens up a great you know invisible pipeline when it comes to something like a supply chain attack. You know, the uh, version 1.000117, you know, et cetera, et cetera, is not going to go noticed by by the end user. It's just going to get downloaded a lot of times without even prompt, right? Um, so, you know, even if the provider has has failed, um, it's also in my in my view, you know, it's it's up to you as a, a user and consumer of that software to enforce you know, zero trust and, and principle of beliefs privilege as much as you can. You know, if if this software is coming into the environment and demanding, let's say, domain administrator level privileges, 
you should be questioning that. You should be talking to, uh, you know, the head developer or whoever of the software and saying, why do you need these privileges? You know, uh, these these are not uh, things that we just give out like candy. We need exact, you know, reasonings for why, and we also need to know exactly what you're going to be doing with those privileges, so that when we see you using them, we know that it's legitimate, right? Uh, there's also, you know, monitoring that comes into play here. There's there's so many other elements that that you have to consider. But you know, from both sides of the coin, there is responsibility there. And I I think um, it's easy to say that it's one or the other person's responsibility to to do that. Um, and you know, sometimes it's even written into the contract. <laughs> but regardless of what it says in the contract, you should always be doing your due diligence, whether you're a developer or a security person. Yeah, so it, it uh, kind of playing on that too, it sounds like you know when when you realize that a system requires some some additional privileges, you should be better understanding what they're used for. And then does that is that also then the the onus on you to to try and put some some constraints or monitoring around the use of those privileges absolutely right like you, you know uh, <laughs> to put it in terms of active directory it is literally your domain right like it's it's something you should be always looking at whether it's a you know third party software account or one of your own accounts if it's a domain administrator it should have every single action monitored and and fact checked, you know, to the best of your ability, of course. But um, if there's any, you know, if there's any account <laughs> that's going to be used for uh, something malicious, it's going to be one of those, right? Um, so you know, you you always want to have that idea that you know, the the farther up the chain you go of privilege, the more restrictions there should be the more you know those things should be locked down and the more those things should be watched and monitored you know just like um you know when uh, <laughs> when you elect an official to office everybody's got their eye on that official they've got a lot of power but they've also got everybody's eyes on them it's just it should be just the same when we're talking about a, a domain admin it shouldn't be some shadow it account that's used to log into user workstations and make some little fixes here or there. It should be something that's very closely monitored, restricted, and, and follows a very defined process so you can detect those anomalies. Are there, Jordan, are there any um, resources, tools, uh, and same to John, that you think uh, people should be, be looking for, or looking at to help them understand how to put constraints and how to put monitoring in those areas yeah i mean quite honestly uh i, I would point to john uh, he's literally written the book on this right so uh so john feel free to uh to share no i'll actually kick it off because i'm i'm more of a uh, people and processes guy in in supply chain i mean there's there's always there's always going to be tools there's always going to be technology and I'll go back to what Jordan says, but on the the process side, right? I mean, it's a it's a foundational. Uh, you, you you need the basics. You need the blocking and tackling before you do you go to the Super Bowl. And uh, you can have the best tool in the world, but if if your processes are crap, it's it's garbage in, garbage out. So I'll, I'm I'm just gonna set you up, Jordan, and just say that. The processes have to be in line with whatever tool you're you, the organization is using. Yeah, t couldn't agree more. Um, when it when it comes to this stuff, you know, it, it kind of goes back to what I was saying about monitoring, right? Like the the key element there is the human element, um, but it's it's really a combination of things. Uh, the way that we always put it is people, process, and technology, right? Uh, just like John said. You know, you need that process there um, to make sure that, you know, you need a process to create a domain admin account. You need a process to monitor a domain admin account. You need a process to carry out actions as a domain admin account. It sounds like a lot of red tape, but that's the point. You know, that's what you need to, to see stuff like this. The more um, 
shall we say, like unexpected actions that are happening on the network, that's the higher amount of strain that goes to those other two elements, the, the people and the technology, right? The, uh, the technology is there, you know, you can have things like user behavior analytics and your EVR, EDR, um, you can have things like uh, an antivirus that has, you know, ransomware protection or, or any of those things in there. Those are all definitely going to help you. But again, like John said, you need processes to push those things forward and you need people at the helm to, to drive them. Um, and, you know, the, <laughs> uh, I think I would be remiss too if I didn't say when it comes to people, uh, I think uh, if, if you're a developer, you, you absolutely know what I'm going to say here, uh, but people are, are always going to be the, the fixers or the problem solvers, right? Like no process or piece of technology, no matter how well designed is ever going to be perfect. Um, you always need somebody there to, to correct it and, and steer it in the right direction. You know, if we, if we think about something like user behavior analytics, the only way that we got there is we, you know, are manually feeding this robot data point after data point until it gets to the point where it, it can do stuff like UBA. But when a new behavior emerges or when a, uh, an old behavior comes bad, we need to be there to, to tell it to look for that, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's there, kind of what i There's a lot of care and feeding when it comes to designing what you're monitoring and, and uh, change over time, right? Exactly. It's uh, it's going to be like you know there there's a lot of a lot of power a lot of manpower that goes into uh, into building a successful security program. So you know it's uh, it can be very daunting to to look at something like this. Look at a problem like supply chain attacks, which in a lot of ways are are kind of at the the top of the pyramid as far as you know the worst things that you can have happen to your network, right? Um, and I think that's why it's so easy to dismiss them and, and risk accept them because uh, it's it's a tough problem. It's something that is going to require a lot of investment and time and you know care and feeding, as you put it, to uh, to fix it. But you know it's it's also the goal that we should all be aiming for is that level of resiliency. Um, and how do you get to the top of the pyramid? You build it one block at a time. Yeah, John. Um, you know, you were you helped develop the 800-161. Are do you think we're going to see an update to that or generalization to like non-federal systems? Are there? Um, do you see anything progressing from that? Yeah. Thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, ping that. So a couple of weeks ago, we released the update to SP 800-161. Uh, it's the, our initial public draft. Um, co public comments are due June 14th. Um, we, we've, we've done a lot of streamlining. Uh, we've tried to broaden it out so that it's more applicable to non-federal departments and agencies. Uh, that, that's not always to do be easy to do because there, there's just certain things that we have to focus on in the federal space, but We've also tried to uh, broaden it out to be applicable to anybody in industry. Um, so that's out there. And then last February, we released uh, NIST IR 8276, which are key practices in cyber supply chain risk management. And those are underpinned by 24 key recommended activities. So it's it's eight high-level practices, but it's actually the uh, recommended activities that are essential. And each of those activities are kind of mapped to different standards. So it'll tell the user not only what to do, but it'll point to how to do them. So again, I think there's a lot of information that's out there and available. Uh, it just takes a little attention from folks. Yeah, great. Um, I do it just for folks on the phone. We have a few more minutes for questions. Please type it in if you have any uh, question to ask. Um, this is from Danielle. Uh, Rapid7 reported they were attacked via Bash Uploader, but stated Rapid uh, that they were not using CodeCub for their software product development. Um, so yeah, and I, I read a little bit about this where uh, 
they were using it for a, a specific system, uh, not for all of their uh, product development. Um, do you, Jordan, can you can you uh, give a little more detail on that? And if you know know it, uh, and the question also is, you know, has the breach been spread through the other software besides Bash Loader? So you know, I I don't think I'm the uh, the best person to to talk on this. I can tell you what I've read through you know threat intelligence feeds and things. And yes, that that much is true as far as uh, with Rapid7, and that that's kind of an example actually of you know the segmented chains I was talking about, where you know Rapid7 used this CodeCov product, which like we uh, described maybe did not have the most secure model, uh, shall we say, but um, they only used it in this one segment so that when they were attacked and when, you know, their data was accessed, it did have a limited impact. So, you know, that that's kind of a thumbs up to them, I guess, as far as, uh, as, far as that, the limits of that. Um, but from what I understand, uh, the main impact on Rapid7 specifically uh, is that the source code for their MDR agent was accessed. I don't think that there was any changes made to the source code. So, you know, uh, the the example I was giving earlier with, you know, if an MDR agent is compromised is thankfully not true in the case of, of CodeCov and Rapid7, but it's easily something that could happen um, in the future. You know, it's, it's something that this attacker had the ability to do, they just didn't do it in this scenario. So, um, yeah, I guess, uh, a bit of good news and and yeah it's it's uh it's good to see as well that you know a security company like rapid seven has put in place some controls that limited the impact of something like this great yeah so uh jordan uh or actually john i think i think maybe this is to you i i'm i'm thinking you know if we we follow that advice to never let a good crisis go to waste and we know uh, you know, executives at organizations have limited attention span, right? And they 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 are fighting the fires, right? How should cybersecurity and risk professionals use these recent supply chain incidents to drive programs that enhance resilience? What do you think um, would be the top two things or top three things that you would talk to in those executive conversations about? You know, what's what's the potential? Uh, what's the risk here? And and what? How should we be addressing it? I'll, I'll go first because Jordan probably has a better answer than I do, but I'll just throw in there that I, I think that uh, cyber supply chain uh, risk management, similar to cybersecurity, needs to be better integrated into enterprise risk. And that's that enterprise risk that kind of flows up into the C-suite level. And so I think a lot of it is going to depend on the actual uh, sector or subsector and the risks that are identified uh, but it's always wrapping it up into a story that executives can understand on a one one sheet of paper that has lots of colored graphs in it uh, so it's trying to simplify it down to the basic risks that they're going to understand whether that is you know reputational financial uh, lots of uh, stories on loss of intellectual property in the supply chain. Um, there's a lot of lot of statistics and research from insurance companies about uh, disruptions in the supply chain. So I think it's just the messaging and the story that you can tell an executive. Yeah, I, um, a CISO I worked with once called those Fisher Price diagrams, right? The the you know, as simple as possible to understand the risk and and what you need to do to to manage it. And Jordan, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, first of all, I agree. The uh, <laughs> the Fisher Price approach, as you put it, is uh, is always an effective one, right? Like, uh, it's easy for me to uh, to rail off on you know uh, Bash and principle of least privileges and you know all these different uh, technical concepts but when you bring it to the executive level and when you're looking at this from a uh, you know top down perspective um, I agree with John it's it's definitely something where you kind of want to boil it down to uh, to the you know the things that are at most risk and the things that will have the most impact in changing the strategy um, what I think is great about supply chain 
attacks in particular um, is that, you know, they take advantage of a lot of these things, right? Like they take, take advantage of these, you know, I guess, assumed levels of privilege. They take advantage of, you know, poor security hygiene, et cetera. Um, and those are things that are generally viewed as nice to haves, right? Like when you, when you look at a network, for example, um, it's always, it always seems like a nice to have to say, oh, well, yeah, administrators should have user level accounts, but, uh, you know, we just don't have time to implement that. Well, in the case of a supply chain attack, if you could provision a user level account for one of these pieces of software uh, rather than an admin account, uh, you know, that would be a huge win. Um, and it's also something that you can do with zero additional cost. All it costs you is some, some man hours for your security team, right? So um, I think there are a lot of really small, quick wins that you can push off of the back of this really basic practices like, you know, strong, uh, strong administrator passwords, you know, it sounds like so, so simple, but uh, it's something that I constantly see as a, as a problem. Um, you know, I, I was working on an incident a few days ago, actually, where uh, this administrator account was breached externally. Somebody just guessed the password for it and it had domain administrator rights on this network. Uh, the password was four characters long, you know? Um, and when I talked to the client, they were like, oh, that's been on our to-do list for the last two years. Um, and the silver lining of the attack is that that password finally got changed. You know, those those poor practices, the RDP that was exposed to the network that they logged into finally got removed. Um, so I think what we can do here is learn from the mistakes of others, see, you know, this kind of, waterfall effect happening and create those segmentations and create those, you know, those quick wins where we we leverage the technologies and, and the power that we already have to make positive security changes for our environments. Yeah, great. I think I'll, uh, I'll wrap it up on that note. Um, we are coming to the end of the hour. Uh, thanks uh, to you, Jordan of F-Secure and, and John from NIST. I think that was a great conversation. I'm sure we all found uh, it relevant and timely uh, in the midst of these supply chain attacks. Uh, thanks to you uh, on the call for attending. Please reach out if you have any additional questions about this topic. Uh, we can be reached at info at grf.org. And as a reminder, check out the rest of the digital series on grf.org and information about our newly established Business Resilience Council. And look for our periodic special briefings on urgent threats as well as regularly scheduled events like the upcoming summit on security and third-party risk. Stay safe and have a great day. Thanks very much.